Hello everyone, welcome to this webinar for the Centre for Commercial Law Studies, Technology, Media and Telecoms Law Institute. It's lovely to see you all out there today. It would have been nice to do this in person. Um, sadly, that's not been possible because of COVID-19, but perhaps it's, uh, it's actually suitable for us as technology lawyers that we use the very technology we theorize about regulating and how we should deal with it in order to have this sort of event. Uh, this is one of a series of online seminars celebrating the 40th anniversary of the Centre for Commercial Law Studies and there will be many other seminars, some of the past, some due to come still, uh, marking the eight dedicated research centres across the CCLS. Today, representing the TMT sector, we're going to hear from firstly Chris Reed, the Professor of Electronic Commerce, who will talk to us about research at the TMT. Then Laura Edgar, our CCLS Director of Taught Programs, will take over. And Laura is going to talk about how our research leads our teaching and the innovative activities that we've been involved in there for many people teaching online has become a real new thing to get to grips with uh, with COVID-19 but of course at CCLS we've been teaching postgraduate programs online since 2003 so we like to think we were ahead of the curve in that regard. Our final speaker today will be Dr Robin Callender smith who is not only a multiple alumnus of Queen Mary's School of Law, but he is also now our Honorary Professor of Media Law at CCLS. And Robin will be our third and final speaker, and he'll talk about the alumni experience and what you take away from CCLS and how that impacts your experience in the real world. I would ask, I know a number of you will have questions throughout uh, about the various presentations. If you would, for the sake of bandwidth, please keep your microphones muted during the presentations. If anybody has a question, if you could post that in the chat facility, to, uh, which will be on the right of your screen if you pull it up, then we'll be monitoring that and we can take questions there. We're primarily going to take most questions towards the end of the three presentations, but if there's a quick question here or there that we see pops up, I'm sure one or two of our speakers may wish to take that on while we're doing the switch over between presentations. So that all said, I'd like to hand over now to Professor Chris Reed, who's going to talk to us about research at the Technology, Media and Telecoms Law Institute. Uh, you're muted, Chris. I am indeed. Yeah, I, I got the message. It, uh, nice thing about Zoom is you start speaking when you're muted and this big red thing comes up saying, oh, my God, you're muted. Um, that, thank you, everybody else, for muting yourselves. Um, if you forget, we'll pop through and turn off your sound and turn off your video and so forth. Um, but that's fine. So here I am, Chris Reed. Uh, I'm one of the people who claims it's their fault that we have a TMT Institute because I turned up in, would you believe, 1987. And I was the first full-time member of staff. However, Christopher Millard was um, then practicing full-time with Clifford Chance, but he was doing some stuff for us in 1986. So he claims priority over me, but whatever, we've all been there for an awful long time. Um, and what that means is that we have uh, uh, really quite a remarkably long history of research in this area. Uh, here we are. So just getting my slides up for you to have a look at it. Um, okay. I was publishing in the 90, early 1980s, so was Christopher Millard. Um, Ian Walden started a little after us, but if you really want to dig into the history, you can find some of our earliest works. Uh, we don't recommend them to people anymore because our thinking has moved on. But rather than taking you through a long list of individual research that we've been undertaking over the years, I thought it would be nice 
instead, or more useful really, to tell you all about um, some of the collaborative research that we've been doing. Because we just work as individuals, we come together in groups and we produce collective research projects run by us with researchers who come in and out and sometimes join the full-time staff as, as Gavin did. Um, we recruited him for a research project a long, long time ago. I can't even remember which one now. And um, for some reason, he, he stuck around, as, as tends to happen with these things. So uh, we began in the 1990s. We, we did various projects for industry. We did some work for IBM on document imaging as evidence. Um, that was quite important. Would you believe that, that back in the uh, early 1990s, there was real doubt whether images you scanned images of documents could even be seen by a court as evidence and that courts might reject them. So we did some foundational research for them. Uh, we did some research on e-money. Uh, at that time, there were no laws on electronic money anywhere in the world, but we decided that we needed to do some research on the topic. And so we, uh, we began that, published a, quite an influential report written by myself and Lars Davis. And an early project which maybe had even more significance is the research project which founded the EU e-signatures directive. Um, the European Commission gave us that uh, contract in the 1990s and we reviewed over 70 laws around the world, all of which were different, all of which were taking guesses at how on earth you might, might possibly regulate this new phenomenon of electronic signatures. Uh, from those 70 laws and legal proposals, we analysed the fundamental requirements for legally effective e-signatures, and we were very pleased to see that these finally turned up in the directive. Um, of course, the actual e-signatures directive ha had significant defects, as, as those of you who have studied it will, will recognise, um, but that's okay because uh, that wasn't our fault. We didn't put the problems in our report. Uh, the good things that were in there, we claim credit for. So, what are we doing today? Because, again, I've got 20 minutes in total to do the entire history of all the research we've done. It would take me a couple of hours to give you a brief outline. But what are we actually up to today? Well, today we have produced one of the biggest specialist research teams in the world that exists. Okay. Uh, we have at any one time somewhere around 20 full-time members. Uh, you know, people come in on for a one or two year contract, they do some work with us, they move on, others come in. So numbers go up and down, um, but it's certainly the equivalent of about 20 full-time people working on this. There's hardly anywhere else in the world that has that many people working on TMT research topics. Between us, we run round about 30 PhD students. Um, and my slides, when I show them to you again, will say maybe more because students are shared. So, um, for example, um, I have a student who is currently working on artificial intelligence and authorship of works of art. Now, that brings in the intellectual property side. And so she is supervised both on the intellectual property side and by us. So I claim maybe half of her in my number of 30 plus. Right. All these people are working on legal issues in the field. All of these people are really um, taking, aiming to move things forward and to do brand new stuff. So what I claim that we're always trying to do is, is that we're trying to surf the crest of the wave. We're trying to look at the legal issues that most people haven't yet realized even are legal issues. And so recently in the last few years, we've worked on foundational research on new issues. We began researching cloud computing law before anybody knew there was such a thing. We've done work on artificial intelligence. We've done work on blockchain. Uh, we're currently looking at online content control extensively. And then of course, later researchers build on our foundational work at which point, generally speaking, we don't carry on with it. We're already working on novel things. So, you know, my main writings on e-signatures were published over 20 years ago, and I haven't published anything major since. I've left that to other people. I've been working on artificial intelligence and blockchain in the last few years. What about recent big projects then? What are we currently up to? 
Well, I thought I'd tell you about, about two big projects which we run over recent years because they're both actually very significant and very important. Uh, the first one I'm going to talk about is our cloud legal project, which is also the Microsoft Cloud Computing Research Center, um, which is run by Professor Christopher Millard. Um, it's split into two bits because the cloud legal part is purely legal work and the MCCRC project is a collaboration with Cambridge's uh, computing lab to look at an interdisciplinary work on how uh, technology and law come together and the problems that come up from that. So in the MCCR work, MCCRC work, we have published foundational stuff about how cloud computing works, looking at it both from a technology perspective and a law perspective and bringing that together to produce explanations, which in, in the case of some of those pap first papers are, are cited in by pretty much everybody who writes about cloud computing. Uh, Microsoft very kindly funds this uh, as a charitable donation. Um, it doesn't tell us what to do. We decide our research program and we tell them what we're going to work on. And this has been running for seven or eight years now. We've produced uh, 29 research papers already on the Social Science Research Network. And there are three or four more which are going up in the next few days. Um, so on what's happening that year. Hot topics have included cloud contracts, uh, our first major paper was a survey of cloud contract terms, which nobody ever ever done before, and which the world found immensely useful. It's had something like 10,000 downloads, maybe even more, from the Social Science Research Network. That's been updated twice now, and the most recent update, I think, went up last week. So if you're comparatively what the terms of all big players are, that analysis is up there. Lots and lots of work on data protection, and it's so horribly complicated that we've written about it a lot. Uh, blockchain, with the L that's missing from the slides, we've done papers on, on blockchain itself, looking at off-chain assets, things like using blockchain for share registries, for land registration, We've looked at the money laundering problems involved in that. And we've also looked at blockchain as a way of making information available worldwide out of regulatory systems. And to do that, we looked at energy regulation and green energy transparency. And we tried to explain how you could use blockchain to link all the regulatory systems that have information about sustainability and make it all available or parts of it available worldwide. If you want to know more about this, if you go to our Cloud Legal website, uh, and actually if you just search for Cloud Legal in Google or, or your search engine of choice, you will find that site turns up on the first page. And there you can browse through all our research, download the papers, have a look at what we've been doing. So that's one of our research projects. The second one I want to mention is a major project on the enforcement of online gambling law run by Julia Hornler. This was funded by the European Commission, and this is a fascinating project, and we're doing much more of this kind of thing day by day. It's a multinational, multidisciplinary research team. It had lawyers in it, it had social scientists, it had computer scientists, and they produced a substantial report uh, for the European Commission, which were, is already influencing the way that gambling law in Europe is developing. And Julia has given evidence to the House of Lords Gambling Committee that came directly out of this. And so that's likely to influence the shape of UK gambling law in the future. What about planned projects then? Well, we've got two big projects which we hope will come off. They're both currently out there waiting for funding decisions. And if we get them, these will be very substantial projects indeed. The first one is one that I'm running. Um, I'll let you see me because it's my project, so I know all about it. Don't need to see the slides. What we want to look at is the uh, governance and regulation of artificial intelligence. Right. We all know about AI. We all think of things like self-driving cars. 
What we don't realize necessarily is that artificial intelligence comes into important things like decisions about whether to make loans, uh, decisions about how to run investments. Artificial intelligence is there controlling nuclear power stations, making sure they don't explode. Uh, artificial intelligence will increasingly come into our everyday lives. It's already built into your phone in part for things like voice recognition. So if you have a dictation app or you use one of the online dictation services, you're using artificial intelligence to do that. It's becoming in deeply embedded in our lives. And of course, once we hand over decisions from humans to machines, then we want to be reassured that the machines are making good decisions that don't produce harm for people, that don't damage our fundamental rights of privacy or um, our rights of autonomy. There are all sorts of potential risks. And the idea is to put together a multidisciplinary team that is going to establish uh, an overarching model for how we should do this thing and then show how it can be translated into important industry sectors like uh, banking and financial services or healthcare, just to, to pick two examples. The other big project that is, we're currently waiting to hear about is run by Professor Julia Horner, if we get it. And this again is going to be a multidisciplinary project. There's going to be a team of researchers who are going to look at online harms and privacy enhancing technologies. They're going to mix law, technology, the humanities and social sciences, and they're going to investigate a wide range of issues, including privacy, um, how you police online harms without actually intruding inside everybody's lives. You know, should the police be rummaging inside your phone for evidence that someone else elsewhere is committing an online harm or not? What about vulnerable groups? How do we deal with them? People who can't necessarily communicate as clearly as others, for example, or people who might suffer more if you communicate with them in a particular way. Duties of care. This is a big one. Um, currently, governments around the world are thinking of making Facebook and Google and all the other big players liable for what their users do. That's a major change. An awful lot of exciting stuff will be happening if this project goes ahead. And then as far as our other research activities are concerned, there is just far too much individual research to mention. Uh, over the years, we've produced literally hundreds of books, articles, reports, research papers. Uh, some of these are listed on our website. It's just too long and tedious to list everything. Yeah, my own CV runs to, I can't remember how many, three, four, five, six pages of publications, and others look very similar. But one of the things you might be interested in is the way that we're involving our LLM students. We have this huge population of LLM students who are wonderfully well qualified and have some great practical and experience and theoretical skills. And so some projects let us employ our LLM students as part time researchers. For example, um, take that project I talked about for the uh, cloud computing for the cloud legal project that looked at energy sustainability and blockchain. Uh, it, I worked on that project along with uh, uh, Lauren Downs and the two of us employed a team of six LLM students who worked part-time just under a day a week uh, for us for about 12 weeks and they found and analyzed the materials we needed and they actually wrote the drafts of the sections. Now we were looking at the energy sector and one of these students was from Brazil. He was an advisor to all the major Brazilian energy companies on green energy and sustainability. Another guy was from India and he had in practice advised most of the major Indian uh, electricity generating companies. I tell you, you can't not use that kind of expertise and they all brought some really wonderful stuff to the research that we, we produced. So finally, I've got, I guess, a couple of minutes left, and I think what I want to do is to talk about how we turn research into teaching so that Laura can pick up on that and carry on. Yeah. Now, back in 1987, when all this was getting going, we had just one LLM course, one, one module. That's all we offered. And as we did more and more research, we found new and interesting things that were so interesting and there was so much to say about them, they had to have their own LLM module. 
often we were the first in the world to offer that particular subject uh, for postgraduate study. Um, I've lost track of how many modules that we now offer, 25, 30, it's, it's a ludicrous amount. And of course the field is growing and growing and growing. Our module topics always include current areas of hot interest because you can't avoid talking about it. I mean, if I'm teaching you e-commerce regulation and something really interesting and exciting is happening, which I'm researching, then you're gonna hear about it from me. And to be honest, we're usually the lead researchers in the field. So sadly, um, when you look at the reading list for a module, then if it's my module, you will find my name all over it. And I, I don't actually apologize for that. We are the lead researchers in those fields. You're going to have to read our stuff. I guess our aim in taking our research into teaching is that if you come to our classes, you should be the person who hears it first. And so you get an advanced preview of our research before we set it out to the wider world. I'm going to stop there because I reckon my 20 minutes is up and I'm sure to get a message from Gavin in a second to tell me to be quiet. Let me hand back to Gavin, who will then take us further on with the seminar. Thanks everyone for listening. Thank you, Chris. That's uh, great stuff. <clears throat> it's um, really interesting, actually. I've been looking at the, the chat and some of the names coming up and some of the names have popped up on my screen. We've got a lot of our alumni out there, a lot of very familiar names. It's lovely to see you all still interested in what we're doing and coming back in to see what's happening today. I'd like to, at this point, then hand over to Laura, Laura Edgar, who is our resident CCLS Director of Teaching. And Laura's going to pick up on that last thing Chris introduced us to, how our research and our innovations in teaching have impacted on how we deliver that knowledge to our students. Laura. Hey, thank you very much, Gavin. I'd also like to say welcome to everyone. It's so nice to see so many familiar names, if not faces. And I'll just share my slides with you so I can talk about the... Yes. So when Gavin asked me to talk about technology, media and telecommunications teaching at CCLS, I really wondered how I was going to be able to do justice to the broad range of teaching that is developed in this area and also to the staff who teach in this field. So I decided to break it down into four areas. First of all, by looking at how the teaching has grown in this area. Following this, I wanted to look at how we've diversified from teaching our LLM in London to teaching programmes in Paris, Beijing and online. And I also wanted to briefly mention how we have and will continue to adapt to the challenge of COVID-19. I wanted to draw this to a close as well by mentioning how all of this is achieved as a result of collaboration with the TMT community of staff, students, alumni and the legal profession. So we'll start by looking at how our teaching in technology media telecommunications has grown over the years. Now, the reason you're, you're all here is because I think you'll agree that this is a fascinating and absorbing area of law. Chris mentioned a few of the particularly interesting aspects where research is being conducted at the moment. Um, but individual researchers, as he mentioned, are researching in a wide variety of areas which have led to the development of a number of modules on the programme. When I started at CCLS, many of the topics that we offer in TMT law hadn't even been considered. And over the last 20 years, the range of subjects has grown dramatically and the staff involved in the teaching of those modules has grown along with that. I just wanted to show where we'd moved from. So we started off at the Department of Law at Mile End, where Queen Mary is based, the University of London, and then moved for a few years to Charterhouse Square before um, ending up at Lincoln's Inn Field, where we are now. Now, Chris mentioned that in 1987, we had one module on the London LLM, and we now offer over 30 modules in the TMT specialism. Now, I couldn't include all of the different module titles on one slide in a readable format, but I wanted to list some of the topics that we cover to give you an idea of the broad range of subjects that we now teach in this area. As Chris explained, many of these modules have developed from research projects and individual research. And you can see from the subject areas 
there's a range of topics from data protection law to cybercrime to e-commerce and regulation of the media. Now I just want to pick up on a few of these. Obviously I can't talk about the interesting uh, legal developments in all of these areas. But for example, I just want to pick up on one aspect of TMT law, looking at the field of media law and looking at how the range of modules has to developed from subjects looking at the ownership of the media and broadcasting regulation uh, to covering aspects of illegal speech and obscenity. And now moving to areas looking at the law and business of film and even the use of animals in media and entertainment. Now, while some of our modules are more practice focused, such as IT transactions and e-commerce transactions, others are more theoretical in basis. However, common to all of the modules is the approach of international and comparative law teaching. We have students from over 80 countries joining the programme in London with a mix of legal backgrounds. Therefore, although students are interested in this common law approach to these topics, they're also keen to understand the application of EU law and consider how legal developments in other jurisdictions in Asia and America affect the development of TMT. Now we have a new module starting this year on eSports law and I wanted to mention this because it will show you how some of these modules have developed. This module will be the first module developed in this area on eSports law and Gitano Dimita has been researching the legal issues arising from video games for over 10 years. And his research has led to a number of different modules on our LLM programme, including modules on interactive ent entertainment law, and now this new module on the growing area of eSports law. Following from Chrissy's presentation on research, I wanted to demonstrate the development of his research in the area of video games and show how this has led to several modules and also to a series of academic conferences on games and inter interactive entertainment law, and also to uh, a journal in the area. Now we offer a broad range of modules, as you can see. Some of these modules are more skill-based, such as the Entrepreneurship Law Clinic, which is a module that allows students to develop their professional skills by working with legal experts to interview and draft advice for entrepreneurs. Now this provides students with the opportunity to experience law in a practical context and to develop many of the skills that they require for their professional career. Students have the opportunity to examine and understand the practical legal issues that are faced by entrepreneurs and to consider how to respond to these issues by their involvement in interviews and drafting advice for clients. So this also helps the students to develop practical skills such as presenting and public speaking and to work within a team, um, a network um, of, of legal experts and entrepreneurship specialists. So we offer the greatest range of TMT modules um, on our programmes in London, Paris and online. Now this leads me to how our teaching has diversified over the years and how we've moved from our London LLM teaching to developing programmes in Beijing, Paris and online. In Beijing, we offer a joint degree programme with Beijing University of Post and Telecommunications. Now this was introduced in 2004 and while there are many other joint programmes in China now, it was the first of its kind between a UK and a Chinese university. Now these programmes are for engineers and the one we uh, are teaching on is on e-commerce engineering with law. And Gavin Souter and Michaela MacDonald, who completed her PhD at CCLS, teach on this programme. And they teach on a flying lecture model where the staff fly in from the UK to deliver a week's worth of lectures and tutorials several times per term. And they teach a range of modules from e-commerce law, IP, cybersecurity, cybercrime, etc. All of these modules cover both EU law and Chinese law. And this is an incredibly competitive program um, with over 500, 600 students of whom around nearly 200 take the e-commerce and law pathway. We also teach in Paris. CCLS has developed uh, an LLM de degree programme taught from the University of London in Paris. This was introduced in 2013 
and it draws in students not only from France, but also students from a range of other countries and over 40 different nationalities. As with the London programme, there's a mix of students who have recently graduated and also those who've been in practice for some time and who wish to develop their knowledge in a specific legal area. Now, students can study towards a range of specialisms, including TMT, which is taught as a mixed mode offering, combining modules taught in person in Paris with some of our distance learning modules. In Paris, the programme is taught in small blocks with staff from London travelling to Paris to teach in blocks of two or three days. And this block teaching approach is useful for the students who are in practice as they can complete the programme without having to interrupt their professional career. Students come in for a range of, from a range of countries for their classes, um, which is taught by London academic staff um, and practitioners. Now, we've also introduced a distant learning programme. This was introduced in 2003 as a LLM in computer and communications law, but we've since renamed that to be an LLM in technology, media and telecommunications law. And like the London programme, it started with a handful of modules. We now offer around about 25 modules in a range of subject areas. Now, research mentioned by Chris Reed on cloud computing by Christopher Millard and the cloud team led to the development of modules in this in the cloud computing area. And also Julia Hornell's research on online gambling that Chris mentioned led to the development of a module on online gambling. Now, the DL programme targets students who don't want to spend a year in London studying full time but who instead wish to complete the LLM part-time, generally when working. Now, the majority of students are lawyers from a broad range of countries, approximately a third of them from the UK, a third from Europe, and a third from outside of Europe. There's clearly a great deal of dedication from the distance learning students combining work and study. And Students joining the programme can start not necessarily with an LLM, but also with a certificate. Certainly those in practice may already have an LLM qualification and want to join the programme so they can study towards a certificate and taking modules in new areas that have developed and that they would like to study in greater detail. So students joining the programme with intent, some join the programme with intention of taking the LLM and others join simply with intention of taking a certificate and sometimes then choose to continue on and complete the LLM or diploma. On our distance learning programme, we've had a growing interest from students without a legal background and working in a range of IT jobs from compliance, communications, regulatory sector and media. And these students are keen to understand the legal principles and regulatory framework in TMT uh, for their job, but they don't have the requisite legal qualification to join the, the LLM programme. So we decided to set up a pathway about four years ago to enable those students without a legal background to join the programme and to successfully, on completion of the pre-sessional module, join with the students on the main LLM distance learning programme. So this pre-sessional pathway provides students with an understanding of sources of law, how the legal system works, as well as practical research and writing skills before they go on to study principles of contract, tort, criminal law, etc. And a number of students on this pathway have now successfully joined the programme and completed the LLM. Now these students coming from an IT or regulatory background often bring a different perspective to some of the legal issues that we're discussing and often present some practical solutions that haven't necessarily been thought of with, by those of a, with a legal background or raise different questions uh, to the, those who've studied or who've joined the course with a legal background. In addition to our distance learning, we've also introduced a flexible LLM programme. Um, this is to enable students to choose how they structure their programme. So they can choose how and where to study, they can com combine a term in London with taking modules in Paris and then complete their programme by distance learning. This gives students the opportunity to benefit from the flexible modular structure to combine modules from different locations and to study in the format and where they wish. And we've also provided uh, bespoke executive training to a range of audiences over the years. 
Now, as everyone, we have been forced to embrace the challenge of COVID-19 and to rethink how we can present and teach our modules. In the spring term of this academic year, staff had to quickly move online, presenting classes, discussions, tutorials through Blackboard Collaborate um, and some sessions on MS Teams and Zoom. Bearing in mind the uncertainty of our second wave and the rules on social distancing, we need to consider how we can conduct our lectures, seminars and tutorials in September. Um, given that many people now spend many hours of their day in online meetings or classes, obviously students will generally now be familiar with this format. However, as I'm sure many of you have experienced, there's a desire to step away from the screen after several hours of back-to-back -back Zoom meetings. So we do need to consider how to present and engage with students using combination of live synchronous classes, lectures, seminars, tutorials, and asynchronous activities such as discussion forums, case studies, interactive groups activities where students can network, uh, and a range of educational activities which will enable the students to engage both with academic staff and with their fellow students. We've also had to take into account that some students may not be able to start their programmes in London in, in September. And so we've introduced a couple of changes for this year, which include a further start date in January for students to join the LLM programme and an intensive nine month LLM in addition to the 12 month programme. So this will enable students who are unable to start until January to be able to complete their studies by September. Now to achieve this range of teaching, this has involved collaboration from our TMT community of academics and teaching legal practitioners drawn together with students and alumni. We're fortunate to have the support of legal professionals and alumni to provide both guest teaching and mentoring. The mentoring has enabled students to be paired with, men with mentors from a range of firms and companies and to give them the opportunity to have a first-hand insight into the law profession from lawyers, judges and other industry partners. Now there are clear benefits to the student from this as it helps them to network and plan the professional pathway. And we've also had an enthusiastic response from the mentors as to the benefits of working with enthusiastic students who are studying cutting-edge areas of the law. Now our teaching and events draw together the contrib contributions of staff and legal practitioners in, in the area. Um, the week before last, we held uh, an event for our distance learning students. Now we usually hold a weekend event in London each year uh, for students and staff to network and present papers, but we had to move this online this year. And in addition to the presentations from students, we had contributions from the cloud, the cloud legal team, which Chris mentioned, with a presentation on the research on what happens to someone's social media account after they die. And we were also joined by one of our PhD students discussing AI and liability in healthcare, which provoked a lively debate between Ian Walden and Christopher Millard. Now we're very lucky in the TMT Institute to have staff, both academic and professional services, who are very enthusiastic and provide a friendly and nurturing environment for students and staff. I wanted to draw this section to a close by emphasising the importance of this community of academics and legal professionals in this field. Several of our LLM alumni have gone on to join the teaching team, including Anne Flanagan, who's here, as they studied on the LLM before and joined the academic staff. And I'd like to hand over the next presentation to Robin Callender Smith, who has a long history of studying, teaching and mentoring with us at Queen, Mo Queen Mary. Thank you very much. Thank you, Laura. That's correct. It's uh... Interestingly, as you say, a number of our staff have liked it so much when they studied here, they stayed with us. I have fond memories of supervising Gaetano's LLM dissertation on peer-to-peer -peer, uh, file sharing, which was the, the fashionable subject of the day back in 2004. Uh, Bindu Chib, who's another alumni, of course, also teaches with us in China. And as you say, we're going to hand over to Robin, just as soon as Robin's ready uh, to... I am. There we are. I'll let you take off then, Robin. Super. 
Um, I'm sort of speaking for uh, a lot of the alumni who are um, signed in to uh, listen to this uh, because uh, my path through Queen Mary and to CCLS uh, has meant that um, there have been a number of staging points where I've either been uh, leaving Queen Mary to do something else uh, or coming back to Queen Mary to find out what it was I was actually doing in the first place. Um, and my slides are uh, to emphasize uh, the theme I've chosen, and I'll just get them up on the screen. Now, hopefully they're up there. Uh, someone will tell me, I hope, if they're not. Yes. And the, the um, theme, effectively, is um, the journey of learning, earning, and then returning. And that's returning not just in the going back sense, uh, but in the way in which alumni uh, and former students generally can give back uh, from the, the experience they develop from the cycle of what they're doing. Um, I began uh, life as a journalist with the Eastern Daily Press uh, and that was an apprenticeship. Um, there were no uh, universities dealing with uh, journalism. Um, you had to, you learned it as a trade. Um, and I share that, in fact, with Roy Good, uh, because Roy uh, didn't go to university to learn law. He, in fact, became an article clerk at a firm of solicitors in Portsmouth and came to Queen Mary, uh, having developed um, a formidable commercial reputation, but out of an apprentice's background. Um, when I did my uh, first degree at Queen Mary between 1970 and 73, um, I was lucky to get in because just about every other university had turned me down on the basis that because I'd been working for about five years, I'd never be able to go back to study. Uh, nothing could actually be further from the truth. Training as a journalist is actually very useful because like a jackdaw, you learn to pick things up very quickly and put them down. And uh, as a lawyer, that's also an extremely useful skill once you get uh, into the litigation world. Um, then I did my bar finals. And uh, before going into practice, I worked as a senior lecturer at a technical college where all the students uh, were, um, in fact, uh, university graduates doing um, a conversion course at a technical college to learn the skills of journalism and reporting. And one of my uh, first graduate students, in fact, at the technical college was a guy called Alan Rushbridger, who many of you will have heard of, is the former editor of The Guardian and The Observer, and he's now on Facebook's International Oversight Board. Um, I hope that I had some part in getting him interested in freedom of speech and uh, the issues that have occupied a lot of my life. And while I was there, uh, I in fact wrote um, a short textbook on press law because I felt the um, existing material, uh, which was uh, a correspondence course uh, really wasn't adequate for the way media law and journalism were going. Uh, I then practiced as a barrister uh, in the temple, a common law barrister, and during that period in 1978, I picked up uh, what has become a background skill uh, that I continue with. Uh, this, fr this last Friday, I was working on one of the national tabloids at a distance that I could see all the um, pages that were going into production. I could see all the headlines and check those. And on a separate feed, I could see the copy that was going into the online version of this newspaper. And that's where a big divergence has taken place between the print media, which is still quite slow and limited in terms of space, and the online digital and unlimited uh, media. And in fact, on uh, the tabloid that I'm associated with, uh, it's having a big drive to 
cement its online presence, but the law that you get out of that is very rapid. I will get a message that requires me to read copy very quickly and make an almost instant decision about whether it can be posted online. Um, after working as a barrister for nearly five years, I was hunted out to work in the financial and corporate field, uh, mainly dealing with communications and, um, uh, and public relations. Uh, and um, I did that for 10 years. And uh, at the end of, or the beginning of 1991, the market slumped very badly. I feel as if I've le lived through so many recessions uh, that um, I really don't want to see any more, but there's always another one on the horizon. I repurposed myself is probably the best way of describing it, uh, to uh, relearn all my criminal law, and I became a prosecution team leader for the CPS in London. Uh, ironically, working uh, within the Tower Hamlets and Hackney area. Um, and I did this for uh, about eight years. And um, I realized looking ahead, uh, because I could see my uh, 60th birthday coming over the horizon, uh, that I'd better uh, repurpose myself again uh, as a court administrator, in fact, at Thames Court, which is just uh, up from the Myland campus, uh, because uh, that meant that when I retired, I would have purged my prosecution background and make myself eligible for part-time judicial appointments. And essentially, it's when I, um, when I retired uh, in uh, February uh, 2007 that uh, my second life took off. Um, it involved, uh, on the left-hand side, uh, judicial work, and on the right-hand side, uh, regulatory work. Uh, because of my uh, commercial bids and defences background, I was able to be appointed to the Financial Conduct Authority's Regulatory Decisions Committee, and I became deputy chair of that uh, just in time to deal with some of the early LIBOR decisions. Um, on the left-hand side of the, the slide, the uh, part-time judicial work that I then started doing involved mental health, um, crime as a deputy district judge, in fact, often sitting at Thames, um, immigration and asylum, one of the most difficult areas to actually deal with. And uh, for the purposes of this slide, one of the most important features, uh, I was appointed as a freedom of information and data protection judge. I'll come back to that in a moment, but you can see that I've retained involvement um, on the left-hand side as an adjudicator, and I now have my own arbitration and mediation chambers at Arbiter. Uh, but on the right-hand side of the slide, it also meant close involvement on the executive board of uh, the Chartered Insurance Institute, um, Ofgem's um, Enforcement Decision Panel, that's Energy, uh, as well as some other um, conduct uh, issues. Going back to FOIA and data protection, and this is where the first of the major links with CCLS comes. Uh, the chamber president uh, for uh, this sector of activity was a guy called John Angel, Professor John Angel. He and Chris Reed had just written a book called Computer Law. Uh, and John was appointed as the, um, the judge in charge of the whole of the data protection and freedom of information area. And he came along to watch me do a five day case involving the BBC. And he said, uh, Robin, uh, you're very good at the front of house stuff, uh, but I don't think your black letter law is quite as good as it could be. Why don't you go to CCLS uh, where you will find that there are a group of individuals who understand information law and you will benefit from their wisdom. So, in 2008, I audited information law uh, at uh, CCLS. And this is something that any of you can do. And even if you've finished your LLMs or your PhDs, 
you can always go back and audit another course. I learned uh, and loved uh, what I heard from um, Anne Flanagan, uh, Chris, uh, Christopher Millard and um, Ian Walden. I learned very quickly that what I wanted to do was a master's. So the following year I did. And that meant I kept working in all the other functions that I'd been doing on the other slide, picked one day, uh, which you could do at the time, uh, where all the options that I wanted to do fell into and did my LLM. And inevitably, um, having done it, I wanted to go one further. Um, I'd enjoyed the discipline of going back to study and um, both uh, Christopher Millard and Ian Walden agreed that they'd, for their sins, take me on as a PhD student uh, with the topic of celebrity privacy uh, and the media. Um, the dynamics of that meant that I got much more time uh, to teach as well. Uh, Ian and Christopher generously gave up portions of what they were teaching so that I could uh, test out one or two of my theoretical areas with real live postgraduate students and I learnt an incredible amount from that arc, from the master's learning into the PhD learning. Um, and again, uh, for those of you who've maybe done an LLM, uh, there are ways of doing a PhD now uh, at CCLS that can be done in a distance fashion. Uh, and you really should consider that. From um, the PhD, came a textbook um, with a fairly um, obvious title and then uh, the, the honour, first of all, of becoming a visiting professor and now uh, being an honorary professor. Um, taking up the themes of returning and networking, um, one of the key elements that Gavin and I have developed is involvement with the Price Freedom of Speech International Moot at Oxford. And um, we, thanks to a former director of CCLS, again, putting something back in, uh, Mr. Justice Cranston, as he was then, uh, Sir Ross Cranston, as he is now, um, he made available the very famous Court 18 the libel court, the old fashioned libel court where Oscar Wilde's trial took place um, in the Queen's Bench Division for final preparation for those in the CCLS's mooting team going to the Oxford uh, moot, the five day moot involving really universities from all over the world. Uh, I want to come back to the uh, price point because uh, it relates to the very bottom topic on the uh, right hand side of this slide in a moment. But we've organised uh, for students to sit in with broadcasters and often if I was doing a duty on a newspaper, we would try and arrange for two or three uh, postgraduate students to sit in with me so they could see how um, newspaper law works in practice. Uh, we developed many pupillages um, in the Financial Conduct Authority. Uh, I was able to organize um, for a PhD student colleague of mine uh, whose topic related to the FCA's work uh, to in fact sit in in a confidential way on a lot of their decision making uh, to improve uh, her understanding of the topic she was working on for her doctorate. And then in terms of overseas opportunities, uh, I found myself on several times in Helsinki lecturing. Uh, Kazakhstan was a super um, joint networking um, event. Uh, one, of the, one of my classmates as an LLM student um, managed to get an opening for us to do an expert report for the Council of Europe and the EU uh, on open justice. And we presented that with a number of uh, overseas colleagues uh, at a, a senior professional level to the Supreme Court in Kazakhstan, uh, telling them how the open justice uh, norms should work 
went down like a lead balloon, but we did it. Um, then uh, there's been work in Luxembourg. Um, uh, my wife and I have a, a home also in Malaysia in Penang, and we've been able to speak to the Bar Association, particularly in Penang, uh, at Prague, and also uh, in Singapore. Now, I've seen that one of the um, attendees for this, uh, this particular um, presentation is Zeke, um, Zeking Yong, uh, who is the Data Protection Commissioner uh, for Singapore. Uh, Zeke very kindly uh, put me on a platform in Singapore uh, on the edge of the Cambridge, Analy uh, Cambridge Analytica and uh, fake news debate, just as it started off. And sharing that platform was uh, Facebook's um, head uh, in Singapore. Um, and out of that came an invitation to speak at a closed workshop uh, in, um, at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, uh, where one of the delegates was Maria Ressa from, um, from the Philippines. Uh, now, some of you may know that she's recently uh, been convicted. One of the other attendees, in fact, was the woman who was uh, responsible for her prosecution, um, Lorraine Badoy. And the scenario behind the way uh, Maria Ressa has been prosecuted is very, very similar to going back to the top left of the slide, the kind of thing that was coming up in the uh, freedom of speech moots. Nearly all of you who've mooted will understand now what we were doing then was actually really preparing for the kind of crazy world uh, in terms of social media and free speech that we have now. And finally, um, I'm still returning uh, and I'm still networking. Um, in a month's time, I will have finished a distance learning uh, postgraduate diploma um, involving four online modules, and that'll give me a diploma in international arbitration, and um, that will act as a further foundation for the arbitral and mediation work that I'm doing now. So you really never stop. Uh, on this cycle of um, learning and returning. So, um, I haven't actually been watching the time too much, so I haven't, oh, hope I haven't overrun too much, but I'll hand back to Gavin now. Yeah, that's absolutely spot on. Thank you, Robin. And uh, I think <clears throat> Robin stands as proof not only of what can be achieved when you come out of CCLS, but uh, possibly a warning that our our uh, courses can be addictive and uh, I, th I think we're, we're on your fourth now Robin by my reckoning I am do a certificate you've got one of every option Queen Mary offers so you know Quite possible you can decide whether you want to complete the set later or not uh, at this point I, I would wanted to acknowledge one of the people quietly sitting in the background there I know this is David Goldberg and David, Dr. David Goldberg, who has been uh, visiting staff with us for many years, who retired last year, but David uh, became involved in 2004 with us when we were first starting up doing media law, and he had long experience and that sort of thing. In fact, David was involved in starting the very first media law related journal in the UK, now known as Communications Law. And uh, I think it was Frank Cass's Communications Law and Policy, if I remember rightly, originally. Uh, but David was a, a tremendous inspiration and help in getting media law, the M and the TMT, off the ground at CCLS all those years ago and has contributed a lot over the years. And some of you uh, who have dropped in today as well, I see on the chat line, will be former students who uh, have been taught also by David. So... I, it's nice to see you here, David. Uh, the Thank other, you very much. Uh, you're welcome. Thank the, you. The other, <laughs> the, David, have you, have you a few words you'd like to say, or I'd love I'd love to hear from other people, please. I'm I'm here to learn. <laughs> uh, modest as ever. Uh, the other person I'd like to mention is another example of things our alumni go on to to 
He's a young man called Charlie Sewell. I'm not sure if Charlie's out there today, but Charlie was one of our graduates from the 2018-19 season, and he, or was it, nine, yeah, 18-19, and he's just let me know that his dissertation, which is frankly the best thing I have ever read on Section 1 of the Defamation Act 2013. We'll be putting a link up to it somewhere on Queen Mary websites very soon, so please look out for that. If you're into defamation, it really is the best thing I've ever read on that um, and the highest mark I've ever given for a dissertation, but that's now been published in the Journal of Media Law. So uh, do look that up if it's your area, because it really is great. Um, at this point, I'd like to hand over then to ready to take questions. Could I just say one word? One word has occurred to me. Oh, please well, do, yeah. Could I just say one word, Gavin? Do indeed. Go ahead, David. I think we, you might have... David, have you been muted or... Uh, I think he's, we've, for, he's Gavin. I think his, his connection has dropped out, so we'll, uh, we'll, we'll let him speak when he comes back. I'll go back to David when he returns. Then, well, I'll throw it open then to uh, to everybody else. If anybody has a question or anything they'd like to raise, do please fire away on the chat, or wave a hand, or unmute yourself, or make yourself known somehow. It would be nice to hear from our alum out there and tell us what they're doing. That'd be nice. Yeah, it'd be great. Anybody like to kick that off? Oh, let let let, let me invite Zeke in, who's here, because he uh, um, yes. he he's he he's uh, he runs the Personal Data Protection Commission of Singapore, and um, took our LM. I can't remember how many years back, and I think nor can he now, but. Um, it's been a delight to meet him in Singapore several times, and I'm so pleased. Yeah, hi, thanks, thanks. Uh, thanks for the invitation. Uh, I, I did the LLM 20 years ago, I think, 99, <laughs> 2000. <laughs> yeah, so I, I remember those, those uh, when, when you walk back uh, memory lane, I remember those, those topics that we learned. Um, I, I had been uh, very... Um, and, and I wanted to just uh, echo um, some of the, the views shared that uh, back then, when I was looking around for a place that offered a specialist master's in law or in, uh, in uh, technology law, uh, there weren't that many around, right? And, and uh, CCLS was the, uh, was the pathfinder and, and I'm, I'm actually uh, quite, uh, quite uh, happy that, that uh, that's, that's where I ended up, right? Although, although I must say that... Uh, during my year in London, I took a short weekend up to Cambridge and I told my wife, you know, Cambridge had, had kind of a nicer environment than London. <laughs> but, uh, well, uh, that's that, right? Um, and and um, I really appreciate also the, 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 um, the, the opportunities to uh, link back with, uh, with our old professors, right, uh, and, and former teachers and uh, and um, and and um, there are quite a few opportunities that actually we we have been exploring and working together. Just um, for example, uh, some of the uh, areas around um, AI regulation of AI and uh, AI governance that we were talking about last year, and uh, data protection, right? Um, so, uh, well, uh, it it has been a, a good um, uh, experience, right? Yeah, and, and I think that's uh, one of the, the key things I, I'll share that I, I picked up uh, that lasted much longer than any of the hard law that we learned uh, 20 years ago, a lot of which is really outdated now, right? It's the fact I remember the professors kept, uh, uh, no, uh, Chris, Chris and uh, Ian had kept, kept uh, emphasizing, it, it's really understanding the technology, breaking, breaking it down, understanding the, the different components and how things work and then drawing on the broadest uh, field of law to find those analogies and assembling a legal solution as your first straw man and then building on from there. I tell you, that is one key thing that I, I've kept as a technology lawyer. And it's, um, 
it's been with me all these years and it's uh, been very useful, right? For moving from, um, <clears throat> I, back then I was a prosecutor, I was looking at computer crimes, and then uh, moving on to the courts when I looked into e-discovery and then now more recently into data protection, artificial intelligence, and even some of the blockchain discussion and also uh, some, some of the um, uh, privacy pre preserving technologies uh, that, uh, that we are looking at in this area as well. Yeah, so, so I've been really privileged to have been part of this journey. Thanks. Thank you, Zeke. Thanks. Thank you, yeah. I'm just looking at, I, I'm not sure. Zee was my classmate. Oh. oh, yeah, yeah. Sans, another one of our alumni who, uh, who got involved and uh, decided not to leave, much as I did. I arrived for 12 months. It was the Eclip Project. I started with Chris, the electronic commerce legal issues platform, and I was signed up for 12 months originally, and uh, I never left. That was 21 years ago. It, it's yeah, shocking when you think about it, but, but there we are. Have we any, anyone else there who's got a question or a, a comment or would like to tell us what you've been up to? Hey, Sam, tell them about the SMP. Sammy Bartles was just, he's on from Ghana. Is he still on? Uh. He took uh, telecoms law with Ian and myself. Oh, I he's guess. Uh, yeah, he's there. Ader, I can unmute him. Video. eight or more years ago and uh he he just said that uh you know he's working in telecoms industry in ghana and uh his company was just declared smp and he even remembered what that all entailed so that was that was funny well that's great i think sam if you want to say anything there i think you'll need to unmute yourself but yeah, I, I've sent him requests, so I have a suspicion that suddenly work has grabbed him for five uh, minutes. I see we've got David back again. David, do you want to... Yeah, well, I've. Uh, can you hear me? I can't put on can my video. Be. I've been unvideoed, but I can, if you can hear me. All right, very briefly, I just want to say a couple of things. First of all, uh, I was one of the co-founders of the Moot, the Price Moot Court. We founded it in 2008 at Oxford University in honor of Professor Monroe Price, who had founded the Programme for Comparative Media Law and Policy. And I co-founded it with Danilo Lenardi and therefore brought it to Gavin's attention in due course, which is one of the reasons why there's a QM uh, UL. Um, finally, you mentioned a journal that I founded in 1979 Mm. which was the Journal of Media, Law and Practice, uh, which was published by Frank Cass, a wonderful uh, social science and history publisher in Leytonstone in London, in the East End of London. And um, it was indeed the first ever law review devoted to the topic in the UK, and I dare say further afield in Europe than just the UK. Um, and it um, was, I think, as I say, a front runner. Frank Cass was the publisher. And I used to boast that I had invented the topic in the academic environment in the UK. Now, I subsequently had to recant that. And I'll conclude by paying due deference, as I always do. The founder of the teaching of media law in the UK was a man, a South African radical South African chap called Harry Bloom, Orlando Bloom, Bloom's stepfather, Orlando Bloom, the film star. It was his stepdad called Harry Bloom. And to cut a long story short, he fetched up at the University of Kent at Canterbury and in the 1960s ran courses called the Law of the Public Media. And I, all, all that, and I got course documents and reading lists and so forth from Stephen Saxby at Southampton uh, University. And so I always prefer the founding of the teaching of media law in the UK 
is owed to Harry Bloom, a South African who'd fled from South Africa and had fetched up in London. I tried to get money <laughs> through Orlando um, to found and to fund various things, but Orlando and his uh, stepfather, for various reasons I shouldn't go into, uh, didn't have the most cordial relation, I don't think, so that, uh, that uh, fell away. But it's an important, so 1960s, it starts in Kent, in Canterbury. I found the journal in, in 1979, and um, so these are, you know, I like history, and I think it's important to recognize some of the antecedents, and then the, uh, the Price Boot Court uh, in 2008. And uh, thank you very much, Gavin, for your very, very nice shout out. Completely uh, unnecessary, but very, very decent of you as always. You're such a nice chap. And one of the most sartorially elegant lecturers in any university anywhere in the world. Love you all. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, thank you, David. Uh, I'm not sure what much more could be said about that. Um, it's nice to have you with us and, and you really did make a big contribution to our teaching over the years. So it, it's, it's great that that's been recognised today. Um, I want to take we have a question. I think it's really unfair for David to mention your sartorial elegance because normally Gavin wears two-tone shoes, but he might well be in his bedroom slippers at the moment. You... <laughs> <laughs> You'll never know. <laughs> I, I may be wearing fishnet stockings or anything from the waist down. That's the beauty of Zoom. And uh, moving on from that image, uh, <clears throat> Eamon Tamer has uh, asked on the, the chat, uh, in our collective expert opinions, what are the upcoming developments that we should be watching out for in the coming years in the area of law and technology? Uh, I think Chris would be uh, well placed to start that one off. Oh, what, yeah, what, what's coming up? To be honest, I mean, all I've ever said to students over the years is you ain't seen nothing yet. You know, what, what, whatever we're studying now, um, stuff is coming that will take your breath away and we can't guess about it. Uh, one of the things that I still treasure, bizarrely, is um, I remember watching the original Star Trek on television. I'm old enough and I really wanted a communicator. And I realized a couple of years ago, I've got one. Here it is. Um, yeah. it, it's just like the Star Trek communicator, except it does a lot more. It doesn't just do what they did. It does, it does video and emails and I can play games on it and all loads of stuff that the communicator, it's much better. And look at the size of it compared to the original Star Trek communicator. Yeah. Great big brick of a thing. Um, um have you said anything? Leo, Leo, Chris, so we, we can't quite see uh, your mobile phone, but, uh, well, it was, it's, it's just a very boring, it's, it's a very tedious phone. Yeah. It's a standard phone phone. Right. Yeah. Like everybody else has got. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Well, they're incredible things. And they even make phone calls. Yeah. I, well, yeah, that's the, that's the least used thing that you use a phone for. That's, that's the last thing you think oh. of using it for. I, I've but, often, to use a different geek reference, I've often considered my phone to be the, the realization of the, in combination with the web and Wikipedia, the realization of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Yeah. Yeah, it's but, it's all uh, that too. Is it? You, you've, uh, you've got the book there. It's well, just called. I'm the sort of hoopy fruit who knows where my tile is, Indeed. and uh, it has probably gone over the heads of many people out there as a reference. But yeah, we, we should we should go back to what's coming. I mean, if, if you yeah. want to ask me in detail about what's coming, I have no idea. But if you say wh where is it likely to come from, I think that the big and most interesting thing is going to be the increasing integration, not just of devices, but of devices and people. That's really going to be where the big stuff comes. So currently we're looking at Internet of Things to link up all your devices. So they're talking to each other. Right. Put into that some kind of AI technology to start making decisions about what they do. Then link it to your Google Glasses, modern version, so you can control things. Yeah, wherever you look, that's where you want to be doing um, sensors that that actually tell it about your body, what you're doing, how you're feeling, what your emotions are like. We some people even got implants. I think that integration of technology and humans is going to be where one of the most interesting things will come from in the next 10, 15 years. And scary. 
but he's always been scary, Anne. It's, it's been, it was scary 20 years ago when people Yeah, said, but I think it's gotten scarier. <laughs> <laughs> but I, when I thought in a way, it's, it's interesting that Google Glasses were actually a failure. They were not adopted. Um, and I think the question's now also asked about artificial intelligence and cameras. So I'm not personally convinced we're going in that direction. But I think where there are real advances in AI and big data will be healthcare, because that's clearly where everyone has an interest in advancing and where we're all prepared to accept innovation in our privacy. And I think that's perhaps where the AI sector will really take off. Other areas, I guess, are energy, um, smart cities, those sorts of areas. But I'm not really sure whether we'll see that huge advances in the wearables. I, I place a bet on that. I, I'm not sure. I think people don't accept that type of innovation. Can I jump in at this point? Oh, please do. I was about uh, to bring you in, Christopher. Uh, thanks. Yeah, I, really interesting to hear comments from colleagues on what's coming up in the future. I actually agree that that medicine is hugely important and it'll be personalized medicine. So it's the internet of things and the internet of everybody and combined with personalization of um, pharmaceutical products and embedded medical devices, then there are extraordinary things uh, still to come. Indeed, there's an, an emerging area of law that we haven't really tackled yet called um, neuro law, which is where you get into taking control of people's brains, that's, which does sound scary, or more, more prosaically perhaps people using their brains but being directly connected to the web of all things the internet and uh, I actually think that's closer than than you might you might imagine I mean it's not just uh, science fiction this stuff and one final comment is we've been doing some work for two and a half years now with the Cambridge computer scientists on quantum uh, mechanics uh, quantum communication quantum encryption and ultimately quantum computing which is the most ambitious of all and it, that is also pretty mind-bending stuff. And for lawyers, uh, leaving aside questions of breaking security, you get into quite philosophical areas of where uh, a statement can be true and false at the same time, maybe. I mean, what does this do for contracts, especially so-called smart contracts? Anyway, I just leave, I just throw that out there. Thanks. Thank you, Christopher. I, I certainly find it interesting that just at the time that we had the civil liberties debate starting to bubble up, where the Metropolitan Police in London had announced they were going to use more or trialling more facial recognition technology and CCTV, that we've then also, because of the COVID situation, had the arrival of a requirement to wear a mask on public transport and cover your face. And we, we clearly then have started to see uh, the technology in different ways and our technological stroke medical knowledge developing uh, maybe competing interests uh, where we've got that clash between the idea of cover up for medical safety and but we want to see your face in case you commit a crime and we've got the record on CCTV then so it's uh, I think it's an interesting um, interesting time certainly does anybody else want to come in on that or I just, want, I just wanted to add that I think the interesting point will be looking at the question of liability. Who's responsible when any of these go wrong? Who will be liable for these developments, when, if, whether in healthcare, law enforcement or sentencing? When those go wrong and don't give the results that are expected, which parties will be liable? So I think that will be a very interesting way to investigate further. Can I just do a shout out here for... Um one of our alumni from the Cloud Legal Project, who from the cameras that are on at the moment, I think has the most impressive lockdown moustache, at least. Uh, that's Guido uh, Noto Ladiega, who's a professor now at the University of Stirling and is writing the definitive text on Internet of Things law. So Guido, do you want to just give us the elevator speech, you know, the, the, the one minute summary of what we can expect? <laughs> oh, wow. Thank you. I uh, didn't expect that. I don't know if you can see my amazing moustache here. <laughs> um, I hope not. It's good. <laughs> anyway, yeah. So uh, I've been reflect. Uh, I've been writing this book uh, since since I left essentially uh, Queen Mary in 2016. So it's been quite a long time, um, and I've been trying to reflect on how the law can sort of steer the development of the Internet of Things in a anthropocentric direction. So, you know, how can we make sure that the human being 
remains at the center of the system of this uh, hyper-connected smart environment. Uh, so can we remain smart, the smarter how our technologies get, or the, the other way uh, is the kind of the way forward? That's my, my elevator speech. Great, thanks. Cheers. So do you have any answers? <laughs> well, you'll you know as soon as the book is ready to be at by the end of the, of the year. We've got uh, to buy the book, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Okay, I've, I've, I've got a question off the chat from Projector Kale. Is that, is that right, Projector Kale? Um, who, who says she, she... Yeah, it's a she. Oh, yeah, hi. Hi. Can, can, hi. Can you, I'll ask your own question. Right. Yes, so um, I just want to take this opportunity to thank all of you. I mean, it was such an amazing experience to learn from best minds of the world. Uh, and... Uh, to be honest, uh, it was an enriching experience, not just professionally, but even personally. So I remember Professor Anne Flanagan telling us on the very first day during her address speech that uh, how you make the most of this year is entirely in your hands. So I, I really uh, thank her for this advice and it, it forced me to socialize. It helped me to gain a lot of professional and personal network. Uh, so my question is, so I have moved into academics now um, and I'm also researching on smart contracts, blockchain and AI. Uh, Laura was my supervisor uh, for my LLM dissertation. Uh, I just wanted to know that is there any way uh, we can collaborate with the ongoing research projects at CCLS? I, I can give a quick answer which, which is tell us what you're interested in. You know, because because it, it's uh, the problem with any group like us is that we're all interested in so many things that we haven't got time to work on everything. So yeah. there has to be a match. But if, if you're interested in something we're interested in, then we want to work. Okay. It's as simple as that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. See, and, and people have done that. I mean, c colleagues from all over the world. There's uh, one of our alumni um, who is a professor in one of the Brazilian universities, um, has just sent me a piece of writing to review, which I had some input into. That's one example. Everybody else could offer you a half a dozen examples like that. Right, right. Yeah, and, thank you. And also people in industry. You know, if you're in industry or in practice working on something interesting, you never know. <laughs> we might already also be working on that. And you might know things we don't, and we might know things you don't. So let okay. us know. Sure. Thank you. Yeah, um, I, it's Tammy out there. I think yeah, I saw your hand raised yeah. a minute ago. Tammy Tope was one of our absolute stars a few years ago on the Price Moot competition that uh, Robin referred to. A really outstanding uh, speaker in that. But uh, Tammy, you had a question yeah, for I'm us. I'm here. Yeah, I, would, no. I wanted to um, make some comments. Um, it's really, really, really nice to um, meet everyone again. I mean, I think more than half of the faculty on this call um, are the students in um, your class. So Gavin, Professor um, Reed, and Flanagan, Robin, um, I was a student in your class. And I can say for sure that going to CCLS really shaped my um, flair for technology, right? Because as soon as I left, um, Queen Mary, I started working with the telecoms regulator in Nigeria. And I, I, I've always told Anne Flanagan and Robin that I would want to end up in academia, but I would want to have industry knowledge and industry experience before moving um, into academia. And it has really, really come in handy. Everything that Anne Flanagan says in the class regarding significant market claim, powers, SMPs, um, you know, dominance, as a regulator, I get to see that firsthand. And if I didn't do the LLM in, you know, computer and communications law back in 2012, I probably would not have been interested in the regulatory aspect of um, technology, right? So yeah, just wanted to, and then right now I'm currently um, enrolled as a PhD student at um, Bond University in Australia. Um, my research interest is on the practice of law um, AI 
So the interrelationship between, you know, the practice of law and artificial intelligence, which is a very broad area. Um, but of course, as soon as it's, it's a broad area that the university has research interest in. So as soon as I commence my, my PhD fully, I would now be able to, you know, close in on particular areas um, that I want to research in. Um, and I'm very sure that you guys are going to be getting emails from me as soon as I start um, my PhD fully because it ties in with the whole CCLS, um, you know, technology and media um, um, sphere. So I'd want to ask a question about, um, do you collaborate with, so if once I start my PhD and there's a research area that I probably would, re, if I want to have a co-supervisor um, together with my supervisor in Australia, would any um, lecturer be open to that at CCLS, um, especially if it has something to do directly with the research area at um, CCLS? That's probably one for me, I guess, as I've yeah. been involved in those questions um, in other capacities, like academic dean as well, which, which I did for some years. Um, the, the answer is in principle, yes. It, in practice, it can be quite hard between universities to allocate the research responsibilities. And then they always argue about money as well. So we, we have to sort those things out. Um, but basically, it, the only other problem is capacity at our end. We, there's a maximum limit on the number of PhD students we can supervise. So I'm, I'm running along hitting the maximum at the moment. So I have to say no to people all the time. But I, others, may have capacity and as before ask i mean the, the worst case is we say we love to but we can't but maybe we can i just want to say a bit what Anne wants to say as well uh, there's always an opportunity to come as a visiting scholar so we have students coming for say a month and then they would previously agree with one of us you know maybe a particular topic or a particular area or a particular comparison you would like to make um, so that can be arranged and maybe that's better for you as well because then you can focus on a specific aspect So that's something you could consider and maybe discuss with uh, with Bond Who's supervising? Is it Dan Swanson by any chance? The Dean, the Dean actually, um, the Dean of Law at Bond does right. um, uh, Yeah, yeah, yeah well, uh, uh, many of us know Dan Swanson there. So if you bump into no, him, please say professor, hi to us. Professor James Meek Nicholas James is the Dean of Law at Bond. He's the one supervising me. Ah, good. Yeah. Oh, well, you'll, you'll certainly meet Dan, who, who we all know. Yeah. 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 And yeah. If, yeah. if you do decide to come as a visiting um, researcher, uh, we quite often are able to integrate them. Um, I see Christopher yeah. Millard on my screen who, who uh, can talk about Isabella, I guess, who, who yeah. spent, what, eight months with us, something like that, maybe a bit longer. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, we've had fantastic experiences over the years in the Cloud Legal Project with visiting um, researchers, visiting scholars for more senior people. And as Chris says, they've tended to get really involved in, in our work and we write things with them. So Is Isabella Aldani, who's uh, from Italy, um, came to visit us towards the end of her PhD and she's now co-authoring a chapter. Uh, uh, this is a chance for a gratuitous advertisement for Cloud Computing Law Second Edition, which is nearly finished and uh, should be going to uh, the publisher in the next couple of weeks and should appear in about January 2021. So yeah, we've had some great experiences of people coming to visit us, uh, supposedly for a month, staying for longer than that and ending up writing stuff with us. So we do welcome ideas, suggestions for that. Perfect, thank you. I think Anne Flanagan wanted to say something. Um, yeah, so I, I have someone just this spring who came for six, for six months and was a visiting PhD. He came to do, you know, a, a certain component and we had, uh, well, almost uh, bi-weekly meetings during that time. So yeah, it's a, it's a good way, you know, to have a short but intense focus to, to get a specific area of research um, buttoned down. So yeah. Yeah, thank you so much. Thanks, Anne. Uh, thank you, Tammy. It's good to see you again. Um, the spotlight for a second, Gavin. I, I, want to wave goodbye. I want to wave goodbye to everybody. If I can have the spotlight bit for a second. You're the host. You did it. Yeah. wanted to say hello, say something. No. Yeah, just before that, Anne, I'm just going to... 
I have to leave for a meeting on a budget for a research project. So I'm sorry about that. I want to wave goodbye to everybody and say thank you very much. Uh, for thank you. So, so many familiar faces uh, and names. It's great to have you all here. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. Uh, See you soon. So, yeah, I'm just going to hand over for Darcy, which will be our, our last question today because we're running to the limits of time. But uh, okay. you, you had asked, and I'd, I'd like to give you the chance before we close down. Thank you very much for the opportunity, uh, Gethin. Um, I was actually at the same uh, bet, the same year, like uh, Timmy. And, uh, well, maybe I'm not as uh, famous as Timmy, maybe in uh, computer communication. So, uh, I would like also to uh, feel like a very happy that I gra have graduated from uh, LM and Computer Communications Law, where I believe these days the titles slightly changing. Yeah, and and since I returned, uh, there are many things that uh, I've done in my native country in Indonesia, especially in education industry, as uh, the university where. I used to work for five years uh, in Indonesia. It's uh, one of the oldest school of IT law in Indonesia. So uh, within five years, I teach uh, quite a lot of students. In one class, I can, there is a record. There was a record where I teach about 300. But uh, right now, I'm currently on uh, maternity leave, I would say, because I'm currently doing PhD at the University of Barcelona. My research uh, uh, Topic is about open data versus uh, data protection in smart city. So and there are, there will be complication of the technology that we use here, like artificial intelligence, blockchain, and so on and so forth. I will not talk uh, more further furthermore about it. But uh, is this is really nostalgic for me to uh, see uh, to see a lot of uh, professor that I used to uh, be in their class and then meet some. My familiar faces where I used to be in the same class, like Timmy, Marion, for example, and or even from different beds like Ina as well. So I really happy that uh, Queen Mary is really good, especially in this department. And this is something that uh, we can be proud of uh, until later. And then I also would love if uh, Queen Mary have more uh, partnership, uh, working partnership, especially in ICT or department with uh, other region, for example. So not just in uh, Europe, but also in Asia, especially my region, which has similarities like in Europe, we have uh, ASEAN who share similarities like European Union, although the development are not quite the same like European Union, but we uh, about 11 countries yeah, within part of ASEAN we uh, already start to have uh, together for similar disagreement and so on and so forth. So far, we'll only be about trade, yeah? not so much about immigration, maybe about uh, soft uh, guidelines about ICT policy and so on. But I think it would be nice if like uh, within even education industry, like university, uh, we can be involved more uh, together, yeah, more. And also last question, uh, last uh, maybe statement from me, because uh, this is not, on, not only from me, but also from other alumni of Queen Mary, not actually from the same department. Uh, that Are there any, uh, I was wondering if the procedure, if we want to do visiting research or we want as PhD student, uh, it will be easier if we are an alumni of Queen Mary by any chance, because uh, there are there are cases where uh, one of my former uh, course mates say, "Well, it's uh, we need to spend a lot of money to do uh, visiting research, and then and then sometimes uh, maybe we don't really have enough the we don't really have enough the sponsorship for that, and also there are some uh, requirement that maybe do we really still." Uh, need to uh, uh, comply with this requirement, even though we used to study for the same program and so on and so forth. So I was wondering if there is, uh, I don't know, slightly easier uh, procedure when you want to do visiting research and so on and so forth. And I was wondering if, what kind, what is the best uh, way when we want to do visiting research during this pandemic? Because I believe this uh, 
pandemic uh, is not gonna be finished within one year or so. So maybe we'll be back to normal 2022. Although we already heard about many vaccine, maybe will be produced soon or later. So I will stop with this because I kind of like becoming accustomed to talk with uh, with a long period because of my experience with teach. Even though I still have a lot of experience that I need to learn from many of professor here and other people. So, but I will stop from here. But thank you very much for uh, all the professor Queen Mary, especially. Uh, those the one that uh, run uh, ICP uh, modules. Yeah. This is really uh, this is really important for many people around the world who get the chance to study yeah, whatever is the program. So thank you very much, uh, all of the professor from Anne, Gavin, uh, Robin, and Julia, my former supervisor during my LM studies, uh, Laura as well, and. I think I cannot even mention the other professor from other department too. So I really happy to see all of you are well, not infected by COVID. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, Anne, you looked like you were, you wanted to come in there. I... Well, you know, I, I think talk to us, you know, if you have, you know, we can always, be flexible in a range of circumstances. So I, I, I don't know about the costs, but, you know, just send us an email and see what's possible and how we go about it. I think it's safe to say it's certainly always worth exploring, asking us, if, if anybody has an interest in hooking up with the research that we're doing, and this has come up in a number of questions, drop us a line, talk to us, and somebody at CCLS will know what is possible. Okay. Unless I have any other colleagues who want to come in and offer any final thoughts. Well, I just wanted to. Yep. We're always looking for, we're um, moving to a, to enhance our online mentoring matchups for students from your country. So we're always looking for people who are interested to participate either in a, um, a longer relationship or happy to do, we're going to do some several mentoring speed mentoring events uh come come this fall online and in the spring um you know we welcome your participation on panels and um areas of interest to you um you know all of our teaching is going to be well much of our teaching is going to be online so uh i would welcome you know, people to do half hour slots on something from your jurisdictions or your practical experience. So do all be in touch with us and, and tell us what you'd be happy to do. And mm -hmm. the Institute, join the Institute. Okay. Absolutely. I think really to, to round things up, uh, what I would certainly stress is, as Robin has already mentioned today, the whole idea of students returning and the sense of coming and getting involved again and, and giving back. And I think over the last few years, I've had three or four former students have all taught on some of my courses, either because they've become full-time staff at CCLS or they've come in as guests or or whatever, and, and we are, our doors are always open. It's always great to see uh, our alumni go on. Even we love hearing what you've done and what you've achieved. And uh, I'm, I'm trying to remember who it was, was it Newton who said, you know, if I see further, it's because I stand on the shoulders of giants. Uh, I like to think I'm the footstool, maybe somebody like Robin stood on to see that little bit further over the hill. And uh, obviously some of my colleagues will be the giants, Anne and Chris and the rest of them on, on whose shoulders many of you have sat and gone on. And we love to hear about 
what you've done and what you've achieved after you've left CCLS, obviously partly because we like to believe we have a an input into that, but but we genuinely do enjoy hearing about how our students have succeeded and gone on and, and what you've done post CCLS. So do please all keep in touch. Uh, there is isn't we very much intend um, to keep on building on these sort of alumni events and to give you more opportunities to hear from us, to catch up with us as we would love to catch up with you. Now, at that point, we've, uh, we've slid a little bit past our allotted time, so I'm going to draw the event to a close. But thank you again to everybody who's been here today, to my colleagues who have contributed, uh, my colleagues who've supported the event, to Christine and the team at events who helped promote this and get it set up, and all of you for coming along and attending and your comments and your involvement and do please keep an eye out for more events like this in future as we'd love to chat with you again but thank you